Good evening. Welcome to the Matarica Museum and our artist this evening, Sue Dunker, with her exquisitely colored pastels. I would like first to recognize our sponsors for the show, Judy Fair Spalding, Phyllis Hicks, Paul and Chris Myers, and The Swap Sheet. And also in conjunction this weekend with Sue being in town, um, at the uh, TMS matting and framing on Ridgecrest Boulevard in, the, in their Dragonfly Gallery, they're having a show called Passages, which includes these artists, Ruth Amster, Pat Rogers, Joyce McNamara, Pat Miller, Joanne Engel, Linda Hamlin, and Sue Dunker, with a special tribute to Mary Cutsinger. And the reception for that is this Sunday um, from 2 to 4. And if you have any other questions about that, there's papers around, and Pat Miller would be happy to answer your questions about that. Okay, we're going to let Sue <laughs> tell us all about this. <laughs> Hi, I have to do pointers and clickers and microphones. <laughs> um, it's so good to see all these familiar faces. It's really um, exciting to be back here for this uh, show. This show has really been an impetus for me to get back into painting, so <laughs> this is a big help. Um, Tonight I thought I'd talk about two paintings and where I got the inspiration for these paintings. Um, in 2004, Perry Barnes and I went on an adventure. Perry and Mike Barnes uh, lived and worked in Ridgecrest Tide Lake for about 12 years. And um, Perry got, has her master's in archaeology and she worked in TID in the writing branch. We had uh, kids the same age, we did swimmings together, we just um, had a lot of fun together. Um, after several moves, she and uh, Mike settled down in Sierra Vista, Arizona. Mike works for Fort Huachuca, and Perry has taught history and archeology span at their local uh, college. Along with being the archeologist of record for tours to Mata Ortiz, where they um, do the pottery. And uh, she also is an archaeologist on the Elder Costa tours throughout various sites in Mexico. Last year we took a tour through the Yucatan with uh, the motto, Leave No Pyramid Unclimbed. <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't climb everyone, but we sure had fun at Chichen Itza and uh, the colonial cities like Merida and um, Campeche and many other Mayan sites. Actually, this painting was done um, along the Gulf Coast on that trip. So I just snapped the picture out of the bus and we knew it would inspire me so much. But <laughs> um, this time was usual on Perry and my adventure because we set out on our own with no guide and limited Spanish. Spanish 101. Donde esta los padres? Hola. <laughs> no say. Um, you know. Off we went in Perry's small Toyota pickup. We were going to buy items for a uh, Catholic church bazaar that they hold every uh, November in Douglas, Arizona. It's a big event in the area, and so Perry decided to have a booth there and asked me if I'd like to put some of my paintings up. So that was our goal. Uh, we crossed the border in Agua Priete, and let's get going with our. Um, and went on to Highway 2, which is a major uh, northern east-west route uh, for uh, Mexico. This was before uh, NAFTA, so the trucks were subpar and barely long, so it was pretty exciting. We made our drive a lot of fun. We went through some real windy roads. And um, drove down this road to our first, or my first photo op of Hanos, which is right here. Um, Ooh, look familiar. <laughs> um, it was fun because we ate at corner uh, truck stops and had tamales and tacos and went along the road. Anyway, I forgot to add that. Um, then Perry took the side trip 
and just took a few turns, and we ended up at this church called the Lady of Solitude. Um, I was just totally blown away. And this was the church, and I spent uh, quite a long time photographing the church. Um, it's amazing, it's all in white stucco with these beautiful rounded shapes. Um, since we were there, the mortuary chapel, which was behind the bell in the previous shot, um, right back there, has been restored and is actually used as, as a chapel. The bell tower on the church itself is unusual because the bells are not there. They are down here on the ground along a post, and there are about four bells in a row. Um, so this was my inspiration for the Church at the Crossroads, Hanos. Um, in 1700s, Hanos became a, a presidio and uh, Establicio de Paz, an attempt to um, establish peace in the area and convince the Apaches that they needed to live under the shadow of the church and um, they provided them with education and medicine and food. Spain wanted to keep the Apaches from moving into the center of Mexico, but that didn't work. And in, um, I guess it was around 1830, Mexico gained its independence and the uh, Honest Chapel um, lost its significance. So next we went down the road to Mata Ortiz and bought some nice pots. Um, Perry goes down there all the time, so she knows the potters themselves, and that was a lot of fun. We then uh, thought we would go to an archaeological site called um, Corenta Casas, but it was just too cold and snowy, so we journeyed on to a um, Creole, which is a bustling town and one of the centers for um, the Copper Canyon tours. Um, Creole is a wonderful town. There were lots of wonderful handicrafts we just bought. Tons of fun little things. Um, also, the Tarahumara Indians are famous for residing in this area. They're the Indians that run everywhere. And they have they were short, striped shorts. So. Um, anyway, um, evidently, well, we decided to do the side trip down to Guadapias, um, which is at the bottom of Copper Canyon. Harry always wanted to do this, and so I said, sure, that sounds like fun. So we hired a driver instead of driving ourselves. And um, evidently they used to um, pile the tourists on top of Suburbans. So they would weld these seats, um, kind of like bucket seats on top of Suburbans between six and eight of them, and they'd go be flying down this road all the way to the bottom. Well, and I even read a website that said, oh, if you get a chance, get on these, get on the top. It's so much fun. <laughs> but after a whole suburban load of German tourists fell, tipped over and fell to the bottom of the canyon, that, that's now outlawed, and you have to write its height. So. <laughs> um, so, and of course, there are many crosses and um, lines along the way, so you imagine all the lost their lives on this incredible road. So you go all the way down there to Rio Vadapias. And to get to meet some of the little animals along the way. There are donkeys and goats and um, lots of cactus. And this is at the bottom. We finally come to the little bridge that we saw. It's about over 5,500 feet down to the bottom of the canyon. And that's when that ribbon of river becomes a real size rushing river. Vatopius was um, founded in um, 1630 after Spanish explorers found pure silver in the river. This is a bridge across the river that the uh, natives take. Uh, this is the town of Vatopius. Um, the silver that they discovered in these mines has a very unique crystalline structure that can be recognized to this day. Um, after the initial discovery, there were about 300 mining claims that were made. In 1880, Alexander Shepard, who was the last governor of Washington, D.C., came down here, and evidently he had pre-knowledge of the deregulation of silver prices, so he bought up all the mines, and he 
very rich man. <laughs> Uh, the ruins of his hacienda can be seen across the river, and it's very picturesque. I guess it was modeled after an Irish, uh, uh, what's the big word? Castle. Anyway. <laughs> I can't, that's not right. But anyway, um, he also brought hydroelectric power and running water and smallpox vaccination, so he did help the area. Um, it's a fun town to visit. They have great baskets made by the Tarahumara Indians, and uh, there were several expats that we talked to at dinner time that were just characters. What more can you say? Uh, <laughs> uh, the next day, we um, got in our little suburban, and the guide, without telling us, drove us along the road. Four miles, windy dirt road, all along here, and lo and behold, we came across this incredible building. This um, was the hidden chapel, the so-called hidden chapel. And I had no idea it was there. I didn't know we were going to it. And there it is, with just a few little, little buildings around alongside of it. It's very imposing, very impressive. And um, they did, have done some restoration to the chapel, but um, the interior is pretty well in disrepair. We did find someone who got a key and let us inside. Um, it, just, it just is amazing. And it was hard for me to select a, a view to paint because it was just quite an amazing thing. But of course, that's the one I eventually decided on. And there it is. Um, oh yeah, this is the interior. And you can see I pretty much did a literal interpretation of my painting over there next to the other hidden chapel one. Let's see this one. Except I thought it would be pretty in pastel colors. So it was crying out for pink. Can I explain it? <laughs> so after um, touring the chapel, we went back up the hill. Oh, there's a, there's a better slide. And um, Perry asked the driver if they knew of any petroglyphs. And so I included these just because of where we live and I thought you might be interested to see. I have no idea of any of the history of it, but we ended out in some far field and um, there was this cave and these were the figures. So I just thought you'd enjoy seeing it. I have no knowledge of what it, you know, but there you go. <laughs> That's in Creole, Mexico. <laughs> This was a, a cooperative that uh, we saw along the way. Again, um, a lot of fun, interesting things, hand woven rugs, um, darling little Tara Memorial wood, wood uh, figures, with all with their little kerchiefs, and these things were no more than an inch tall. And they were really cute. And then this would explain the um, community effort of the women of the area and how they founded this cooperative. I thought that was kind of interesting. Then this, this cracked me up because how often do you get to be this close to a waterfall in America? There was no fence. I could have dropped right across the waterfall, right in the water. <laughs> and it was pretty pretty deep. I mean, it went down by the way. So I thought it was a unique experience that you only find in Mexico, I think. <laughs> And there we are on our way back with our truck filled with goodies. And um, that's Perry. And I don't know who that is. <laughs> and there we are at our booth. These are some of the uh, drums we got at Creole. And um, some of those are the little dolls, the Tarahumara dolls. Oh no, but I was surprised. Like. Um, some people bought the wooden violins even though they really didn't work. Um, it was funny what people, you know, selected, but it did sell. And they all, Perry is known for her um, pottery from modern artists, so those, those went really well. And that is it. Um, my exhibit, um, I selected images to paint from Guatemala. Those are most of the, the Antiguadors. Um, I loved Antigua, and I still have many more images I'd like to
to paint. Um, of course, I had to include some images from the Southwest. The painting is under the screen of uh, the Taos Church, and um, adobes are always a favorite of mine. And a few scenes from uh, the ocean, near where I live now. Um, the two small paintings in the corner next to my daughter <laughs> um, were the result of a workshop I took from a fellow by the name of Robert Chapman. And he was the uh, assistant to William de Kooning for seven years. And boy, was that a fun experience. And I wanted to learn about abstraction because Julie was getting her master's, and I really didn't understand it. You know, I'm more of a representational painter. And so I took the class, and it was a lot of fun. And those are the paintings that were a result of that class. So uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you to the museum and Rosie and the gallery committee. Boy, and that spread is just incredible. <laughs> Big thank you to the sponsors. Um, such a treat to have my good friends Paul and Chris as a sponsor. Chris was one of my earlier works and has always been a big supporter and cheerleader for me, so I really appreciate that. I want to thank my daughter for coming all the way from Salt Lake City. Yay! <laughs> and uh, are there any questions? Yes. Instead of the signature, you have oh. a rectangular mark. And I was wondering how you came to decide on how that. I picked that quite a while ago. It, um, my mentor, William Herring, I was taking a class from him, and I was telling him how difficult I found writing my name in soft pastel onto soft pastel and getting it to be legible. So he suggested the idea of a mark. So I came up with about six or seven ideas, and he looked at them, and actually he selected this one. Um, and I just kept it ever since. It's a fun device I found to use uh, to add color where, and keep your eye moving. And so it's, it's been a, my signature for quite a while. Can you tell a little bit about the process? Because when you say paint, I was in pastels oh. as chalks. Well, it is a stick. A pastel is a, a compressed um, pure pigment with just a little bit of binder. And um, what I do is I have paper that is uh, made especially for pastels. It's, it has a texture to it, and so it, it adheres very well. And it's just like um, coloring, you know, that I have a vast array of colors. I couldn't tell you how many pastels I have. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And so I um, just started applying. Most, I, I was going to talk, I'm glad to mention that now. Uh, mostly I usually apply the, no more than two layers. However, the Church of Cotto, that pain was a little departure for me because I was using a larger piece, I wasn't using my usual paper, and it, it would accept um, acrylic. So I made an underpainting of uh, this bright pink metallic. And then I used the side of my pastels. Again, very unusual. I usually just take them and you know, scrub it on. But I used the sides and just did a lot more blending than I usually do. I'm usually more direct with my application. But so they always want to dry? Oh, yeah. Uh, of, uh, no, no. Um, the only thing you could do is, like, if you have the right kind of paper, you can put acrylic underneath it or as a background, and but no, you don't mix it. I have never heard anything. Do they put a sealer over? Some people do. I don't. Uh, most of the uh, most of the artists don't. It tends to dull the colors. If you look, kind of look in the light, they're sparkly. And if you put a sealer or a spray on it, you lose the sparkle. Mm -hmm. And it just looks flat. Yes, Ralph? I'm just wondering whether or not uh, the change in the travel has brought up this bold color you're starting to use in this something oh. to look at in the future. I'm, I'm just really curious. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. I um, My path has changed. Um, I guess it was bound to happen. <laughs> Um, I think this one was just a reaction to the whole thing. I thought, oh, I'm so tired, I hate red, so I just <laughs> <laughs> grabbed the red and I went. But uh, I am adding more pastels and um, a little 
softer colors, I guess you should say, um, from my past show. Well, is it a reflective of your travel? Now? Oh, yeah, you know, that, I'm sure that's why I select places like Mexico and Guatemala. That's, okay. and Taos, you know, those that are certainly known for their uh, beautiful colors.